So the guiding question I'm going to be considering is whether quantum computing can speed up classical linear algebra tasks. And this question um, is a pretty natural one in light of um, the fact that you know, quantum information, quantum computation can be reframed as you know, it's, a, it's commonly described in terms of a linear algebraic perspective. So one might imagine that you would be able to give up to exponential speed ups for you know, classical linear algebra. Um, and furthermore, this like belief that one could do this reflects a lot of the potential you know, uh, excitement behind quantum computing, especially among, you know, for example, like tech companies and things like this. Um, and this, the, 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 the thing is that though, this is a pretty stringent, um, like pretty difficult question, pretty annoying question, because in this sense, we're talking about classical linear algebra tasks that, uh, for example, like, you know, uh, machine learning or uh, somebody who does machine learning or data science might be interested in, and not um, so much, you know, things like analyzing quantum systems and things that other people in this uh, workshop are, are uh, doing research in and giving talks about. So it leads to uh, sort of more difficulty to try to answer this, uh, to, to satisfy this more stringent requirement of a, of a quantum speed up. Um, and I'm going to be talking about uh, basically, I'm going to break my discussion of this question down into three parts. First of all, I'm going to talk about QSVT, this quantum singular value transformation framework, which uh, unifies a bunch of quantum algorithms using this linear algebraic framework and quantum linear algebra algorithms, which use this framework to solve linear algebraic tasks. Um, so this is like a pretty natural way that one would try to use QSVT to solve classical linear algebra tasks. And finally, I'm going to be dis going to discuss um, these like quote unquote dequantized uh, classical algorithms, which are versions of these quantum linear algebra algorithms, which can perform maybe similarly or analogously to these quantum linear algebra ones under a particular condition. Um, and throughout the talk, I'm going to assume that we have access to some fault tolerant circuit based quantum computer, and I might assume even more later down the line. Okay. So first, I'm going to talk about quantum singular value transformation. I'll try to make this relatively brief, um, since, for example, I think Yulong Dong's talk is, is, uh, discusses basically a superset of um, what I'm going to talk about right now. Uh, but as uh, you all might know, people are excited about this because it sort of unifies a bunch of these quantum algorithms, you know, including Schwarz algorithm, Grover's algorithm, Hamiltonian simulation, under uh, basically one single framework. And it suggests that this is a really good algorithmic primitive um, with which to consider quantum algorithms. And in short, how I would describe this framework is about performing linear algebra with this amplitude encoding. So what, I'm, what I'll do is I'll consider encoding some vector into the amplitudes of a quantum state. So right here, I have a vector and I'm considering CAD V to be the quantum state where the amplitude corresponding to the ith computational basis vector is vi. And so I have encoded my vector into a quantum state in this way. And suppose I can prepare this state, cat v. And I want the state corresponding to a v. So where a is like a vector, a matrix multiplied and, and multiplied by the vector v. And I want this also to be in an amplitude encoding. Now, uh, if A happened to be unitary, then we could try to find some circuit implementing it. Hopefully it would be efficient. You know, that would, that would be nice if you wanted to actually uh, run this on a quantum computer. Uh, but in principle, one could do, well, it's possible to do this, uh, to find such a unitary and then apply it to uh, the quantum state corresponding to V. And you can see just by uh, inspection, I guess, that this gives you the quantum state corresponding to AV. And this works when A is unitary. Now, what happens when A isn't unitary? Well, you can basically do the same thing. You can try to find some circuit that, where if you express it as a unitary, it contains A in the top left corner. Um, now, top left corner is sort of uh, not rigorous, but what I mean explicitly is this, uh, this expression for some number of ancillary qubits 
um, for like a many such qubits. And in this case, you can get the uh, ket AV by taking your initial state, appending a bunch of qubits, applying your unitary, and then measuring your ancilla qubits and post-selecting on them being zeros. And if it indeed you get the all zeros vector, then you get the bottom state to be the desired ket AV. And this can hap this happens, uh, the number of times you need to run it uh, is, is uh, sort of this expression I've written here. Uh, one would, I want a lower bound to give an upper bound on the number of times you need to run it. But I'm just going to note here that this quantity is at most the spectral norm squared. So this is what you're thinking of, what I think of as like uh, the sort of cost parameter in this uh, setting. So this is indeed, note that this is indeed a probability because in order to embed A into a unitary, A needs to have spectral norm at most one. So this is, uh, this is why I can do this. And so this suggests, uh, so, you know, we've sort of come at this from a linear algebra perspective and we can formalize this even further by saying that we have like a block encoding of some matrix A. If we can efficiently apply this unitary U satisfying this property that we mentioned earlier, if we can efficiently apply U and U inverse, then we say that we have a block encoding of A. And uh, assuming that this U is indeed easy to implement, um, which might not necessarily be true uh, a priori, but uh, assuming that implementing U takes like polynomial time in the number, it polynomially many gates in the number of qubits, um, I'm going to be considering the main cost parameter to be this like one over the spectral norm of A. And this uh, block encoding is a nice notion, particularly because it allows us to, um, so it's a useful primitive because it is closed under uh, nice operations. In particular, there's this fun, sort of what I call a fundamental theorem, which is generally called QSVT, which is that if we're given a block encoding of a, a matrix A, we can get a block encoding of some polynomial applied to A, where we assume that the polynomial is low degree. And we want it to be low degree because if uh, D is large, then the size of the circuit will blow up by a corresponding factor. And we do need to assume this something about uh, our polynomial, but the assumption is merely that if we actually apply, if we actually um, look at P of A, then we can guarantee that P of A is going to also be bounded by spectral, uh, in spectral norm by one, which means that one can embed it into a unitary. So this is like a, a pretty weak condition. Um, so I've stated a, a specific form, but you can generalize it to non-hermission and you can get rid of this one half in certain cases. Um, so this allows us to basically do a wide variety of uh, linear algebraic op operations, assuming that we have these blocking codings. So for example, one can perform matrix inversion, uh, which is the setting where we have a block encoding of a matrix A, that's, and we say that its condition number is, is kappa, and we have copies of a quantum state corresponding to B. And what we want is we want a, a state encoding A inverse B. Now I can scale the corresponding vector that I want down because that doesn't change the quantum state is normalized. And I consider it to be this phi of A where phi is, a, I, I consider it to be like a matrix function, which is just a rescaling of the inverse. And what I can do is I can find some polynomial that's close to this phi across the entire uh, spectrum of A. So this is the only place where the spectrum of A can lie. So this is the only place where the, uh, the value of P of X is relevant. So I can approximate this function with a small de low degree polynomial and then apply it to the vector B and you know, post-select using the process I mentioned before to get a state corresponding to P of AB, which is approximately P of AB by this approximation result. Uh, and this is equal to the A inverse B that I want. 
Um, now, actually formalizing this is sort of non-trivial. This requires, you know, an algorithm to actually find the circuit that can perform this polynomial. And it also involves finding the polynomial in the first place. Um, but in principle, one can do this. Um, for example, like there are results that basically say that any function that's sufficiently smooth, you know, like a Lipschitz function, uh, can be approximated well by a low degree polynomial. So, so I've written here just like a standard version of such an inequality. There's, there's many in, in approximation theory. Uh, and so this means that I, in principle, I could have replaced the previous, uh, the inverse in the previous uh, slide with basically any function, as long as it's uh, not too spiky. And so this is a really, uh, this, this gives us a broad, broad applicability of this uh, framework and allows us to do a, basically a, a, a huge number of things. Uh, and all of this can be done in, in polynomial in the number of qubits, in, in a number of cases, polynomial in the number of qubits, and assuming that you have the blocking codes. And namely, this is logarithmic in the Hilbert space limit. So one could try to apply quantum singular value transformation to these classical machine learning tasks, classical, classical linear algebra tasks. So uh, the, so my, my image of how one would do this is that we have some input data, which is our A and B in say, okay, I put them in like CSV files, but whatever, they're on a classical computer. And the, uh, I have some current classical pipeline where I want to solve for, uh, I want to find A inverse B, so I just solve for X uh, using my favorite classical algorithm. And then I uh, use that for visualization or whatever, just to get the answer that I want in the end. And I can imagine replacing this procedure by a quantum procedure where I say, okay, I have this classical data. I could try to load it somehow into a quantum algorithm, a quantum computer. And then once, and I could perform some operations and then I could download the final state, uh, the final state or whatever information from the quantum computer and then try to use it for the linear algebra that comes later down the line. So, um, you know, I, I want to both be able to upload this information and download this information such that it's, uh, you know, uh, download information that is relevant to me for uh, whatever purpose that I, I, I have for, for, my, uh, for myself, I guess. Um, and so I've given this example for it, for this QSVT uh, matrix inversion algorithm that I mentioned previously. So, so in this particular case, instead of this classical algorithm, I could try to run my QSVT, and I, I know what I need at the start, and I know what I have at the end. And the question is, how do I just connect this to my classical pipeline in order to get a speed up? Um, and the hope is that if you're able to do this in time that's polynomial in the number of qubits, um, that is polylogarithmic in the, uh, in the dimension, it, for both of these, then the, in total, this will give an exponential speed up because this classical algorithm is going to take, you know, at least linear time. It's going to have to read all the entries and, or something like this. Um, right, so uh, I'm going to, so in order to prepare these block encodings or these uh, copies of these input quantum states, um, there are proposals for how to do this. So. Um, I've given them two that are most relevant to this case here, which is that we have uh, a block encoding for A uh, to a matrix A if A has at most S non-zero entries per row and per column. And we also can get A block encoding to, um, or yeah, so I can get a block encoding to this A if, if it's sparse and I also have some Oracle that can uh, or some circuit that can compute the entries of A, uh, or you can assume maybe some RAM that allows you to do this, uh, some, some hardware that can do this for you. Another thing that you could say is that you can prepare this uh, matrix A over the Frobenius norm of A. If uh, 
it is in this quantum random access memory data structure, which I've given here. And the idea is that if I can access, if I can store all of these values in my data structure, and I can access each level in superposition, then I'll be able to prepare corresponding quantum states and prepare corresponding block encodings, similarly to how um, like Grover Rudolph state preparation work. Um, and so you can think of these as like, both of these are, are proposed to be able to run in uh, sort of polylogarithmic time in, in N. And you can think of this as the sparse case. And because this uh, Frobenius norm is significantly lowers the spectral norm of the block encoding, you can consider this to be like the low rank case because one requires that the Frobenius norm is small, which is sort of kind of like a low rank type restriction or a low stable rank type restriction. Um, right, so this means that so, uh, one could, for example, try to satisfy this loading problem by either putting A, B, and QRAM, or say that they're sparse with this additional efficient computability restriction, and then try to get information from the output quantum state by say, you know, trying to say, say, we can't read the entire output given these copies of the quantum state, but we could perform, for example, we could estimate a particular entry, or we could estimate the spectral norm of X, or we could estimate its overlap with uh, a particular specified uh, vector. And in this way, you could try to sort of fill in all these gaps and eventually get an application, uh, an application of QSVT to classical linear algebra. Um, and I'm going to discuss that next. So something that I should note here is that the reason why I'm being so explicit about this uh, pipeline is that you know it doesn't have to be this way. So you know, for example, in the previous talk, there was some. Uh, or I think, yeah, the previous talk did discuss this, but one could imagine that there's some quantum system and the quantum system is where we get our data from. And so instead of having A and B explicitly in terms of like entries, we could have say like classical shadows of this row measurements or some other description of what this, uh, for what our input is, that isn't just explicitly the entries of A and B. And in this situation, we don't have these issues, uh, these issues, and sort of one is dealing with a different question. Um, so, uh, and I think this is like exciting work that's sort of outside of this like specific you know, pipeline vision of uh, a quantum linear algebra. Okay, but uh, back to it. So now I'm going to talk about some of my work and. This is basically a, around trying to find sort of applications in this sort of pipeline framework. Now, um, sort of before my work, one could sort of look at a bunch of these application, proposed applications of quantum linear algebra. And these answer the input and output problems that I mentioned before to varying degrees. And uh, I've ranked them subjectively here. This is uh, just for its potential applicability towards an exponential speed up for quantum for classical linear algebra tasks. Um, not saying anything about the quality of the algorithms, um, but this is just a, so I'm just subjectively ranked how good candidates I think they are. Uh, but something, okay, and none of, I feel like none of these are as good as, for example, like Shor's algorithm, which gives you, which has an, a, uh, an input that's clear and classical and an output that's classical. And it gives like a definitive speed up. So I don't think any of these algorithms solve the input and output problems to this extent. Um, but in any case, something that um, me and some co-authors showed is that many of these algorithms starting first from this recommendation systems algorithm and then uh, moving on to other quantum linear algebra algorithms in, that are sort of similar, uh, 
uh, can be dequantized in the sense of they can be shown not to give a, an exponential speed up um, in these particular settings. And something that we further notice is that one could split the landscape into uh, the landscape of quantum linear algebra into sort of these two sides, one of which uses QSVT that sort of sparse, uses sparse sparsity-based encodings, and then one of them which uses these QRAM encodings. Now, these are not, you know, if you look at the papers, these aren't QSVT, but if you reframe it as QSVT, you would use a, a sparse block encoding. And so building off this, uh, we were able to give a classical analog to the quantum singular value transformation framework that essentially performs almost as well, maybe with some large polynomial slowdown, but it performs almost as well if you assume, if you have that your block encodings are given, or if you assume that your block encodings are satisfied using these QRAM based assumptions. So um, the way that we do this is that we can define some notion that's like an analog of a block encoding, which I call sampling inquiry access. And in the same way that QSVT has this um, procedure where you sort of get the block encoding to your input matrices, and then using that, you get a block encoding for some matrix that's like a, maybe like a uh, algebraic expression in the input, just some low degree bound, bounded low degree polynomial of the input, which you can apply to a vector to get a quantum state, which has a desired output. In that same way, there's a classical version of this uh, framework where you assume that you have sampling and query access to input matrices. And this allows you to get sampling and query access to uh, some function of your input. And finally, you can apply it to a vector to get access to the output vector. And the thing to note is that when your block encodings are satisfied using QRAM, then you can also get sampling and query access to the same input. So you can imagine that QRAM gives you both these input assumptions. And similarly, you, you can perform, do similar things with this sampling and query access that you can do with the uh, quantum state. So for example, you can uh, measure overlap, you can sample, uh, you can measure in the computational basis, you can uh, sort of, actually, you can estimate entries here and you know them exactly here. Um, and so we can get some analog. And this suggests that quantum linear algebra that uses these theorem block encodings don't emit exponential speedups. Um, right. So I've described one way of viewing these sort of dequantized algorithms. Um, another way that one could view this is, uh, that's maybe uh, more intuitive, is that essentially what's happening is that we wanted to, we wanted to sort of investigate the speed up of this QSVT algorithm. And so what we do is that we want to investigate it, but the issue is that we have these strong assumptions that we need to satisfy that, that are typically satisfied in order to prepare these block encodings. And we're not sure how this, uh, how this affects the, the difficulty of the classical task. So we, you know, we could assume some, some, something about A and B in order to get this efficient block encoding, efficient state preparation. But we don't know how this affects Maybe you could you know, run an, a, an algorithm faster if you assume that A was sparse, for example. And so essentially what we do is that we try to give an algorithm, we try to speed up an algorithm that has this classical data using some information from some like quantum-ish information. So we suppose that we can actually prepare these things and then we use that and immediately measure before performing our quantum linear algebra algorithms. And using these measurements, can we then speed up the corresponding classical algorithm and then use that to get the same result that we would if we just ran the quantum linear algebra? Now, if you can, uh, this is, I guess, uh, maybe like a sort of weaker version of the, 
uh, sort of classical learning algorithms with data that was mentioned by, uh, um, by Jared in, in the previous talk. Um, but essentially the idea is that maybe the heart, maybe the difficulty in, uh, maybe the speed up of this pipeline doesn't rest in the QSVT procedure. Maybe it's indeed the block encoding or the state preparation that gives you the speed up and you could tell just by measuring it and then using that information to do your linear algebra. I hope that makes sense. Um, if there are any questions, feel free to ask. <laughs> um, yes, okay. And the interesting thing is that, um, so the interesting thing is that this sort of pathway, this sort of, uh, these types of algorithms are actually somewhat well studied in the classical numerical linear algebra literature. So these types of measurements that one would get if, if one had these, uh, these copies of states in a quantum computer and measured them in the computational basis, these are, you know, these are important samples. So, and these are well known to speed up machine learning and randomize linear algebra. And, and they speed them up in precisely the way that one would need in order to show that these algorithms are only polynomially slower than the quantum algor algorithms. These algorithms, okay. And I will give an example uh, that is uh, for this matrix inversion task. So if we think about how we would solve the problem of AX equals B given A and B in the classical setting, common solution would be to use gradient descent. So if we have AX star equals B, and we want to find x star given a and b, then what one could do is reframe this as an optimization question. So we could say that x star is minimizing this convex function and then run gradient descent to try to get, uh, you know, go down the landscape and try to find a, the global minimizer of this convex function. So this is, you know, on each step, we go down the gradient and eventually we should converge to the minimizer of F. And so this is how gradient descent works. And supposing that we have some information, some of this like quantum measurement information, we can actually speed up the evaluation of this uh, gradient. So, so if we look at the actual gradient value, this, uh, I guess there should be maybe a half here, but yeah. Uh, the, the gradient is this a dagger ax minus a dagger b, a dagger is conjugate gradient, or it's a conjugate transpose. Then we can write it as a sum of a bunch of individual pieces. So this is just basic, uh, you can see by inspection that this is, a. Uh, <laughs> I just expanded it based off of the indices. And then what I can do is I can use measurements. In particular, I measure I and J with probability proportional to uh, AIJ squared. Uh, and you can see how, you know, I might get this from a measurement of a quantum state. With these measurements, I can actually randomly sample an individual uh, sum man to get an unbiased estimator of the gradient. And in this situation, I can basically replace this gradient with this g i j with x t minus one. And so now what I'm doing, this is a now stochastic gradient descent. And um, I don't, and the behavior of the uh, sort of iteration procedure is the same. With gradient descent, you need a number of iterations that's independent of the, uh, the dimension. And when you replace 
this uh, gradient by this G, you still only need uh, independent of dimension many iterations. And the advantage is that before this A dagger A thing, A dagger AX in particular is hard to evaluate. But these individual pieces are easier to maintain. So, so it's maybe not too obvious how you would perform this iteration efficiently. But the thing to do is that you essentially, what you do is you maintain another vector, uh, this VT. And this VT is going to be sparse. Uh, it's going to have as many non-zero entries as there are, uh, as you have uh, iterations. So this is going to be like T sparse. And so you can maintain this efficiently and use this to find an X star. And the final X star will be in the form A, this A dagger V. So you'll, you'll have a description of it that looks like this. And in this way that we could speed up the typical process for you know, linear, uh, linear regression. And we did it using this quantum information, but indeed this is just a standard classical randomized numerical linear algebra algorithm called randomized, uh, I think it's pronounced cash marge. Um, and so this is a lot of investigation in you know, classical linear algebra. And uh, I think it's nice that there's this connection between sort of uh, these, these uh, quantum measurements and these classical attempts to speed up um, linear algebra. So uh, this is something that was noted by Xiao and Montanaro um, very recently. Okay, so I think I'm almost out of time. Um, I'll give some takeaways, which is, okay, so in summary, um, I've, I've mentioned this uh, sparse input and QRAM input. Here's a brief like comparison. So I've mentioned that there is, the sparse input still has some potential for an exponential speed up. Um, and it, it um, and it's a BQP complete, so it's a BQP complete problem. So it probably, you know, can't be dequantized. Um, and it requires only some mild hardware assumptions as opposed to the advanced hardware assumptions of the uh, QRAM input. Um, the difficulty is that if you assume that the input is sparse, you also need a bound on the condition number. And uh, you also need to, uh, like the difficulty of this output problem is, is quite significant in this uh, sparse case because you're basically operating over the entire Hilbert space, but you want your output to be in some relatively small subspace so that you are able to get information from it. And this might be difficult. Um, and indeed, the difficulty of this like sparse input case reflects, I think, the difficulty of finding exponential speedups for quantum algorithms in general. Um, and so in comparison, you know, this QSVT it still has a potential for a large polynomial speedup, and it is more applicable. Um, so it remains to be seen. So what's what's to be done there? Um, and my general thought is that it would be interesting to see whether um, or I feel like these difficulties are reflective of like the fact that QSVT is like maybe too general of a framework or uh, too uh, sort of the my feeling is that maybe like these, this QSVT is like a framework that isn't particularly fruitful for finding new speedups for quantum linear algebra um, or for classical linear algebra, just because these output input and output problems are sort of hard to work with um, when finding applications. And so if, you know, there's like a potential next speedup for next quantum speedup for classical linear algebra, I feel like it may be the case that it could be rephrased as QSVT, but it might not be found via QSBT in that sense. And the second thing I want to mention is that stepping outside of this paradigm that I've been talking about uh, seems to be productive. Um, so I think, uh, for example, like I mentioned Jared's talk, um, which deals with quantum data more explicitly, um, leads to some really nice results that I think are uh, potential paths forward for quantum linear algebra. Okay, uh, thank you. <laughs>